Happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, you know about that. Oh, this is going to be a good sermon then. All right, okay. Y'all remember that. That's going to come back to play. I am so excited to talk to you today about the greatest comeback of all time. Everybody loves comebacks, right? Especially when the underdog comes from behind and wins like a national championship. Or like you think in the Bible times, like, like David and Goliath. You know what I'm talking about? The, like, or, or like my favorite Bible story of all time where we see Rocky overcoming Drago, right? Because we all know, be honest, Rocky IV is by far the best in the series. And only in the movies could that guy beat that guy. We love comebacks, especially when it's an underdog, especially when you're not quite sure what's, what's about to happen. One of, one of my favorite comebacks of, of all time is from my childhood hero growing up. Anybody recognize this guy right here? Joe Montana, Jolton Joe. Love Joe. I grew up in the 80s, maybe in the 70s too, but let's just focus on the 80s. And this guy led 31 comeback, fourth quarter comebacks, by the way, 31, setting a record at the time. And everybody loved it because as he got older, he just seemed to get better and better. And we love it when the old guys still can show they can still do it. You know what I'm talking about? Because it makes you feel young. You're like, as long as he, if he doesn't retire, I, still, I, I can still go in. Coach, put me in. I'm ready. I'm ready. Doesn't matter that I'm 40 years old. We are excited when the old guys still do it, when they could push the sun back up into the sky for one last hurrah and pause the clock, that aging clock. But here's the deal. The old guys hate it when you call them comeback kids. They don't want you to think of them as coming back because you know why? That implies that they went away or that they kind of had a little lull in their career and things were going. They hate it when you call it a comeback. If you don't believe me, look no farther than the great Bible scholar LL Cool J. <laughs> don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. You know what I'm saying? Bet you didn't see that quote coming on Easter. <laughs> Don't you call it a comeback. We love comebacks. This is, when I was looking through, doing some of this research, I found a Sports Illustrated top 10 comebacks in history. And they included things that, all the naturals that you would understand, like Muhammad Ali, absolutely. Uh, Kurt Warner, that great comeback a few years ago in the Super Bowl. The 93 Buffalo Bills. Get it. That's awesome. No problem. But they also included some strange things that had nothing to do with sports. They included Germany and Japan for comeback nations after World War II. Uh, okay, that makes sense. But they went on to include something that blew my mind. In fact, Sports Illustrated, in conjunction with HuffPo, the Huffington Post, decreed the number one comeback of all time is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Those two come together and agree with us? The number, in fact, they went on to write, and I quote, Having been cruelly and unjustly killed, three days later, Jesus has risen from the grave. The resurrection proved his victory over death and sin. This is not a sermon. This is Sports Illustrated. It was the ultimate victory. Therefore, wait for it, coming back to life is the greatest comeback in history. Woo, is that good or what? That is it. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest comeback without a doubt in history. Jesus himself burst onto the scene, and he shared this beautiful scripture, our scripture today. I am the resurrection and the life. And he is. And he comes and he says, come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are laden with, with cares and anxieties and despair and doubt and all kinds of struggles, bring them to me. I have overcome the world. And he burst onto the scene. So, so let me ask you a probing question. How can something that happened 2,000 years ago, honestly, how can something that old matter today? How can that impact your life today? Where you sit in these rows today, what does the resurrection do to us? What does that mean? Well, here's the truth. Because Christ came back, you can come back. He broke down the barrier. The temple veil was torn in two. He comes back, and he shows us that because he lives, you can live. So today, I want us to quickly look at four great comebacks. There's going to be one in each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four great comebacks that show you why Christ's resurrection matters. 
The very first one we see is in Matthew, and that's this. I can come back from despair. No matter where you are, no matter how down and out you are, Christ's resurrection says we can come back from despair. And you don't have to look far to see struggling people and hurting people and despair or discouragement. It may be you. It may be in your backyard. It may be somebody in your family. We look around and we ask, how do you come back from losing your house? How do you come back from losing your marriage? How do you come back from uh, having a, a broken relationship with your kids? That's tough. How do you come back from financial ruin? What do you do? How, how in the world do we, in other words, how do you bounce back from despair? So the Gospel of Matthew comes along, and it paints a vivid picture of two ladies who are in deep despair, and rightfully so. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles if you want to Matthew 28 or pull up your favorite Bible app and just hold your place there because I want to set the context for what we're going to read. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. It's great to have you with us too. Happy Easter. What we've got happening here is Jesus has just died and Joseph has come along and taken the body off the cross, wrapped it up, put it in a grave. It's been sealed. Now there's a, a guard guarding this tomb and he is in the ground. He is in, the graveyard is set. And we see Mary and Mary Magdalene, two different Marys, coming to the tomb, and they're just sitting there, and they're sitting opposite the tomb. These two are staring at a graveyard. Literally, I can't think of anything that is more discouraging. And we know that they weren't really expecting the resurrection because they showed up with burial spices to anoint a dead body. You don't anoint someone that's alive and well. Lay down, I'm going to anoint you. No, no, no. If he's alive, then you don't need burial spices. So they come. Make no mistake about it. They are in despair. They are not expecting anything. They are hopeless and filled with anguish. And they go, and they go say, hey, you want to go look at the grave one more day? Yeah, let's go. Let's go back. We'll stare at the grave. And they arrive, but something is drastically different. Something has happened, and that's where we pick up the story today. Read along with me. Matthew 28, verse 1. At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on. I love that. I love that defiance. Like, take that, death. Looked at verse 5. An angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Woo! And right there, we see the words, three words, he is risen, that change despair to hope. Three words that mean so much to you and I. Those three words, those three words separate Jesus from every other religious figure in history. Make no mistake about it, there is no equating them. Jesus stands alone. When you look at this, you go to ev pick any religious leader you want. Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, L. Ron Hubbard, Tom Cruise. You could pick any leader you want. They're still in the grave. Well, maybe not Tom Cruise. He's, is he still with us? Sort of. He's sort of here. Right, right. I got nothing against Tom. not trying to. Me and TC, we go way back. But if you go back and look at the graves of those religious leaders, they're there. Only Jesus, is, his tomb is empty. Only he is gone. What is it about those three words, he is risen, that have given every generation hope? Through the ages, every generation has drawn hope from despair. Now think about this. Be, be, be honest. Just do a mental check. Have you ever in your life been greeted with, the stock market has risen. It has risen indeed. You don't hear that. Nobody comes in and says, the value of my 401k has risen. It has risen indeed. Nobody, it may be good news, <laughs> but it's not something that you wake up and you shout and you gather with a billion other believers today, by the way, and shout that. Nobody comes up and says, your age has risen. <laughs> it has risen. Your weight has risen. It has risen indeed, right? <laughs> Don't do that one. You might get a throat punch for that. Don't, that is not, I do not recommend that. Nobody brags, your cholesterol has risen. It has risen indeed. But we do say that about Jesus. He is risen. And for 2,000 years, we have come and we have declared that because finally there is something lasting. Finally, there is something that has broken through that barrier and said, death, you lose. I am emptying out the grave. And because he lives, you can live. This is a huge deal. Think about this. Think about when you're despairing and when you have hope. Even in our modern world, if you come and you, let's say you would just walk in and you are under the pressure of the world, 
and you drag yourself out of bed and you arrive and you go to a life-giving, God-honoring, Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church, and you worship God and you connect with Him, I promise you, 99 times out of 100, you will leave better than you came. Why? Because you have hope. Hope is huge. Hope is a big deal. If you don't believe me, look at this unhappy couple right here. I love this picture. Okay, this is, <laughs> you might see a little bit of your own marriage in here. That's okay. You're safe here. It's the potter's hand. There's no masks. We all got problems, okay? I'm not confessing. There's nothing wrong with Amy and I. I'm just saying, <laughs> when you look at this, uh, just forget all this. Okay, look at this unhappy couple. Any marriage counselor will tell you if they get a chance to counsel a, a couple, no matter how damaged their marriage is, even if it is 99% damaged, hanging by a thread, if they can get that couple to have just a 10% improvement, they'll make it. You know why? Because if they can have an improvement, then that shows there's hope. And hope fans the flames. The resurrection shows you there is hope. And they turn these frowns upside down and they look like this. And they become happy. Well, of course she's happy. She has the remote. I mean, look at that. Wait a minute. That's a terrible example. Again, disregard that. But when you have hope, you know that things can improve. The resurrection of Christ is what fuels our hope. It's what gives us knowing there is something better. Anything is possible now in your life, in your marriage, with your job, with your kids, anything. If you have hope, it feels like things are possible. And the opposite is true. If you don't have hope, it feels like nothing is possible. In fact, Scripture will tell you, hope deferred makes your heart sick. You can't live without hope. These two ladies we just looked at, Mary and Mary Magdalene, when they showed up, they were hopeless. They were filled with despair. But guess what? They heard the news. He is risen. And they walked. No, they ran away with hope because hope changes everything. And for those girls, oh, anything was possible now. And it changed the world. We're still talking about them 2,000 years later. In apex. I've never met them. And we're still talking about them. Matthew comes along and he says, because of Christ's resurrection, you too can come back from despair. So if you have despair, hang on. Your comeback is coming. Then we look at Mark. I love the gospel of Mark. He says, I can come back from defeat. So true. Now let's be honest here. This is the potter's hand. So again, you're, you, we, we all admit it. We've, every one of us here have failed. Every one of us here have blown it. Every one of us here has regrets, done things we wish we hadn't and probably longer than we wished we'd, we'd wallowed around in that defeat. That's what the enemy wants. He wants to knock you off the horse and then to keep you from getting back on the horse. Jesus comes along and says, get back up on that horse and ride. Every one of us has done things we wish we hadn't. Like little Johnny here, who was caught, apparently red-handed, being dishonest in class. And his teacher, Mr. Johnson, calls him up and says, Johnny, I've got a feeling you have been cheating on your tests. And Johnny says, huh, me? <laughs> I don't know why you would think that. Prove it. Mr. Johnson says, okay. I have a copy of your test right here, and I noticed on this question here, it says, who is our first U.S. president? And Mary, the girl who sits right beside you, wrote George Washington, and so did you. So everybody knows that, teacher. Well, wait, just a minute. On your next question, I notice it says, who wrote the Gettysburg Address? Mary put Abraham Lincoln, and so did you. Yeah, I read a history book last night. It's no big deal. We know that. I, I'm not done. The very next question says, who was president during the Louisiana Purchase? And Mary put, I don't know, and you put, me neither. <laughs> so, something's not right. And we've all blown it. We've all done that. And I think, I look around at the apostles, and I'm thinking, what about the people we look up to? Have they blown it? What about the mighty Peter, the rock? One of my favorites. I talked a little bit about this beautiful story a couple weeks ago at a community uni service. This is one of my favorite ones because it shows that Peter can identify with that story. Peter, the one who flexed his spiritual muscles, who came to Jesus and says, hey Jesus, no matter what happens, no matter what these other disciples, even if all fall away, I will not. I have your back. You can count on me. There was just one problem. When Jesus needed him the most, he was not there for him. What we have is Peter, now the night Jesus was arrested, 
standing by a fire, warming himself. And it's a cold night, and he's not standing beside Jesus. He's hiding in the shadows, cowering in the darkness, keeping at a distance from the Lord, whom he just not long ago said, even if I have to die with you, I will never fail. And yet here he is, standing there. Jesus is in the courtyard. He's been arrested. He's got his eye on him. And Peter is warming himself by the fire. And a little girl comes up to him and says, excuse me, aren't you with him? You kind of look familiar. (laughs) Nope, not me. I'm not with him. First denial. A few more minutes go by, warming himself by the fire, still keeping his eye on Jesus from a distance, cowering in the shadows, wait a minute, surely you're, you you look like one that we saw in the garden. You're one of his, I think we got to decide. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not with him. Second denial. Then the girl says, surely you are one of his disciples because we can tell you from Galilee, your accent gives you away. You are with him. You're one of his disciples. This time, it's not enough to say, I'm not one of his disciples. He goes further and says, I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't even know that man. And he calls down curses. He begins to go back to his old nature and go back to Peter when he wasn't Peter, when he was the little pebble instead of the giant rock. And he goes and lives in his old nation. Now think about this. And we know he runs out because he hears the rooster crow, and he weeps bitterly. Do you think in that moment Peter felt like he could overcome defeat? What about us? How would you feel when you fall that hard. What do you do when you have blown it? What do you do? Maybe you've been out of church for a while and you came back and you're checking, you're thinking, will I find forgiveness? Because just a little bit later, Peter hears the words, Jesus is alive. Well, you would think instinctively, oh, yes, woo, I'm so excited. But wait a minute. Remember the last conversation you had? How'd that go? Because I guarantee you, Peter remembers it. Maybe he even locked eyes with Jesus when the rooster crowed. and He realized, oh my goodness, I fulfilled the prophecy three times. I denied him. How is he feeling? How would you feel? What do we do when we have blown it like that? What is it about the resurrection that can give us hope to come back? This is what I love. We are safe here. You can take your masks off. You don't have to put on airs. We don't have to play dress up. When we come here, we can say, you know what? We're going to find forgiveness. We're not going to find condemnation. When you confess sin, when you repent, oh, there's a word you don't hear much in our culture. When you repent and agree with God on the hideousness of sin and what it did to Jesus' perfect holy flesh, then he says there is no condemnation. And you don't come to church and experience rejection. You come and you find acceptance. That's why it's so encouraging to keep reading what Mark says. Mark says the angel shows up and says, go tell his disciples and Peter. Y'all remember this? Go tell his disciple. And Peter is a disciple. Why specify? Because it's like the angel is saying, you make sure no matter what happens, you go find that Peter and you tell him Jesus still loves him. No matter what's happened in your world, Jesus still, you still have a future. Mark is showing up and he's saying, Christ's resurrection means your past. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad it is, is not unforgivable. That is good news. No matter where you are, pastor, you don't know me. And you're making a general statement. You don't know what I've done. I don't. And frankly, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Christ's blood is strong enough to cover and cleanse from all sin. That's what's glorious about what happened through this whole process of Holy Week. We have a future. There's a great story about a Polish composer, a guy named Paderewski. He's a Polish pianist. And what he did one day was he was giving this huge concert. He had his grand piano out, concert hall was filled, and he was getting ready to come out. It was just minutes before the curtain would open and showtime would begin. And a mom brought her five-year-old son to the concert, hoping, just praying, that he would be interested in taking piano lessons after seeing the great Paderewski. (laughs) Good luck with that. And so she brings him, and they're there about halfway through, and she's sitting there in the middle aisle, rummaging through her purse, doing something, not keeping her eyes on little boy. And this five-year-old apparently walks away from her, goes up onto the platform, goes to the grand piano, just minutes before the great Paderewski is supposed to come out. And he sees this piano, and he comes, and you can hear a pin drop. And the crowd is looking, what is this kid doing? It's 6.59, Paderewski's on at 7, what is he doing? And he comes, and the mom looks up and gasps when he sits down and starts 
playing. Chopsticks on the great Paderewski's piano. It's almost blasphemous. And he's playing it. People wonder what is going to happen. Who is going to kick this boy off? And before they could finish their thought, the great Paderewski himself comes walking out from behind the stage, walks right up behind the kid, and you can we see it with bated breath. What is going to happen? And he puts his arms around the boy, and he begins to play the most incredible accompaniment to chopsticks, this beautiful masterpiece. And it's just like, what is this divine music? And he said, as he leaned into the boy, he whispered into his ear, don't stop. You're doing great. Don't quit. Keep going. Keep going. No matter what, don't quit. We are making music. That's what happened next. Jesus showed up alive again and told Peter, come here. Do you love me? You know I love you. Be my sheep. And he restored them three times for each denial. And it was this beautiful, beautiful illustration of how we can come back. What an awesome testimony to the forgiveness. Once we repent, we can come back from defeat. When we look at Luke, we see that we can come back from doubt. This is one of the things that plagues a lot of us. You all know if you've heard my testimony growing up in an atheist kind of household with a, a NASA scientist and, and feeding into all the lies that, hey, we're just a cosmic accident. There's no purpose for you and I. You go make your own truth. There is no, it's all shades of gray. No big deal. I fit right in with this. That's why I love Luke because Luke was a doctor. He was a learned man. He was an educated man. He came from the ivory towers of Harvard. Well, they didn't have Harvard, but he came from some great school because he became a doctor. So he wrote to the thinkers and the Greeks and the philosophizers and those who fancied themselves intellectuals, and naturally they were skeptical. So Luke's the one who comes along, and he records these words. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. But what a lot of people don't know is that Luke wrote a sequel. He wrote Acts, the next book in the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles. And that's where he wrote this beautiful verse. After his suffering, he, this is Jesus, presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was dead. That he was alive. Many convinced. This is a doctor. This is a man who wants evidence. This is a man. You're not going to fool me. Jesus, after he was suffered, he shows up. He gave many what? Many convincing proofs. Do you know what the Greek word here? Here's your hidden egg for the day. This is incredible. The Greek word is tekmeriois. You know what that means? That means legally admissible evidence. Evidence so strong that he was back from the dead that it would hold up in court. So even the Bible says, hey, if you got doubts, bring them. This book can withstand our scrutiny. If you got doubts, you bring them. There is solid evidence. There is convincing proof. You don't have to just take my word. And then Luke goes on to say this. Read this beautiful passage in Luke 24 together. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Okay, now he showed up. Now remember, he had died. So he's made an appearance. Now think what that would do to your room. Peace be with you. He shows up. They're startled and frightened, naturally, and they're thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's me, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I do. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, all right, here's the ultimate test. I love this. He looks at them. True story. Do you have any Krispy Kremes? And he said, no. It's, he said he took some broiled fish. <laughs> I'll take the Krispy Kremes, but he took broiled fish. And he's like, I could just see him. Watch me. Look into my eyeball. Watch, watch. Mmm, <laughs> broiled fish. <laughs> and he ate it in front of them. I am a real, living, breathing, resurrected body. I have conquered death. And he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. All that was recorded about me in the law of the Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the laws of Moses. We're talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All of that pointed to this moment, to Jesus. The Old Testament was crying for the Messiah. So this is where the skeptics show up. Oh, if you like apologetics, these next two minutes are for you. The skeptics show up and they say, that, 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 that didn't happen. You see, the Old Testament was written at a minimum of 450 years before Jesus was ever on the scene. That's a minimum. Most of it was older than that. 
But the latest thing written in the Old Testament, before that was closed, 450 years before Jesus showed up. So in the Old Testament, what's so stunning about it is there's a passage in Psalm 22 and a huge passage in Isaiah 53 that describe in detail the crucifixion of the Son of God. There's just one little problem. Crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. They didn't even know what this was. Yet there it was, 450 years before the Son of God was crucified, describing in great detail. This is, so the skeptics come and say, there's no way mere man could have written that. That, 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 that. That's a hoax. Somebody took old copies and added it later. After Jesus was born, they went and added it. So the whole thing's a fake. Everything here is a fraud. What's incredible about this? There's no way they could know. That would be like me describing today in 2018 a new form of capital punishment that won't be invented until... 2450. Okay, that didn't register. Let me show you what I mean. Let's talk about something we all know. Look at this guy right here. <laughs> Thor Ragnarok. All right. <laughs> Who cheered that? Come on. We all look like that. I want to look at this guy right here. The Grandmaster. This guy's nuts. He is out there. And what he has, he has an implement of capital punishment in this next picture. Anybody know, anybody recognize what that is on the far right? The, the melt stick. When you get touched by the melt stick, you evaporate into a puff of blue smoke. It's a capital punishment. The only problem is, it's not invented yet. This would be the equivalent of me telling you today, hey guys, after this, we're all going to go, and we're going to see those guys on death row, and they're going to have the melt stick touched to them. And you look at me and nod like, oh yeah, we all know what that is. You don't know what that is, because it hadn't been invented. That's over in Ragnarok world. That's 450 years in the future. Do you see how crazy this is? When you put it in modern day terms, there is something huge. So guess what? In 1947, a young Bedouin shepherd boy is doing what shepherd boys do when they're bored. He's taking rocks and he's throwing them up at the rock walls in the caverns. And he sees some openings way up high. And he's, I wonder if I can get a rock in there. And he throws one, only it doesn't land and thud like a rock's supposed to. Something shatters. And he says, something's in there. And he climbs up. And it took a long time. He got in there, and he saw that there was pottery that he had shattered with his rock. And laying there in the debris were documents, scrolls. And it wasn't just his. There were hundreds of them. In fact, it took 10 years to fully explore all those caves in Qumran and get those scrolls out. He didn't know it, but we know them today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. He had discovered them by accident. So the scientists get together, and the skeptics are all over this like moth to a flame. And they come and they're pouring over it because they know this scrolls were dated to the Roman time, way back before Jesus, hundreds of years. So they're looking at it and they are salivating. And they know all they have to do is unfurl these scrolls. If they can find Isaiah and they can find a chapter, when they unroll that, it's either going to describe the crucifixion in this original text or it's not. And if it doesn't have it in there, this whole thing is a fraud. It's been added. So they come, believers and unbelieving scientists together come, and they get to the heart-stopping moment where they find Isaiah. And they unroll these fragments, and they're looking and they're reading, and they get to where we find Isaiah 53. And they look down, and guess what's there? In full detail, the description of the crucifixion. 450 years before it was invented. And just word for word as we have it today in our modern Bibles. So today, when you have doubts and you have a chance to go see a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls, man, it makes your hair stand up. World leaders travel to see this because it is amazing. It bolsters your faith and it confirms every time an archaeologist makes a discovery, it's backed up by what the Bible says. You can come back from doubt. And then in John, we see the best of all, I can come back from death. Because of the resurrection, you and I can come back from death. Now, be honest, do you like talking about death? Can you wait to get to your party, hoist high your Diet Coke, go, hey, guys, I got to go. Let's talk about death. You will hear crickets at that point. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about that. There's a great story about three guys who are at their buddy's funeral, and they're looking at the casket. And they're like, man, he was a good man. Yeah. What do you want said at your funeral? What, would, what do you want? And the first guy looks down and goes, I just want him to say he was a great guy. Here, here, that's good, that's good. And the second guy says, I want him to say he was, he was a wonderful husband and a, a great dad. Oh, that's good. Here, here, dilly, dilly. 
A third guy says, you guys are nuts. They're looking at the I want him to say, hey, wait, look, he's moving. <laughs> he's not dead. Get him out of there. He didn't want to even accept death. Why? Because nobody wants to accept death. Nobody likes talking about it. It's unknown. It's scary, even for the believer. How does life after death even work? Well, Jesus said, I am the resurrection of life. Anyone who believes in me, though they die, they will live. And then he goes to say, do you believe this? Well, now it gets real. Now it's the application time. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you are connected with him, because he rose, you can also rise. Because he lives again, you can live again. If, here's the big if, if you are connected. So I got to ask. I'd be a terrible pastor if I didn't. Are you connected? Do you know him? If not, you can. It's no secret. Right here, we see the gospel. I love what John says. Because there's a risen Savior, your future can be secure. He says this. Look at this next passage in John 20. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which aren't even recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is a good guy. Oh, no, yours doesn't say that? You may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by kind of liking him and thinking he was a nice guy or maybe a prophet, you could, no, by believing in him, accepting him, you will have life in his name. And there it is. Jesus is showing up. He's saying by believing in him, we can have life even after death. I think about those disciples and those apostles who went to their horrific martyrdoms because they knew it was true. Every one of them died a horrifying, painful death. Six of them by crucifixion, and not one of them recanted. Any of them could have. When it came time, 30, 40 years later, they could have said, you know what, <laughs> I see you coming with the cross, and you know what, I'm good, I recant. They could, they could have done that, guys. They could have, nobody willingly dies for something they know is a lie. You might die for something that you know is true, might, every one of them did. And I think about these great legends of the faith, and I think about the ones who inspire all the way up to today, just last month, the great Billy Graham. What an awesome legend. The great Billy Graham finally laid to rest beside his wife. Such a simple thing. Look at this. Preacher of the gospel. Can we zoom in on that, April? I love what it says here on this tombstone. Preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody does this for 99 years believing it's fake. Even he stood firm. And his wife, oh, so beautiful, so humble in death, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. Oh, what a beautiful, humble testimony. Even in death, they knew this is not the end. I've been an act of construction, work in progress, and now it's done. And they step with confidence. The ones who inspired them, the great D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody, who invented Moody Bible Institute, where Billy Graham got his first job being able to sing songs in the night and go through these great shows and talk about the gospel. The great D.L. Moody, on his deathbed, gathered his huge family around him. And he said this. His eyes got wide. And those who were gathered looked at him, and he says, oh, I see their faces. Who's he talking about? I see their faces. And then he began naming some of his children who had died earlier in his life. And he begins to look, and he says, his son comes up. One of his living sons says, Dad, do you think you might be dreaming? D.L. Moody says, I am not dreaming. I have been granted permission to go beyond the gates, and I see my family. I see my friends. I see the saints of old. They're coming. I'm inside the gates, and I see it. There is no pain. I see the kids' faces. This is my coronation day, and it is beyond glorious. That's the kind of confidence and assurance the resurrection gives us. Do you have that? You can. Many in this room do. I count myself in that group. You can have that kind of confidence. Because Jesus rose, you can rise if you are connected with him. If you believe that he is who he says he is. Because of the resurrection, we're not stuck in despair or down with defeat and doubt. We can overcome even death. So here's my challenge. No matter how you walked in this morning, no matter what your background is, no matter if we've known each other for a decade or 10 minutes, 
No matter where you are, no matter what baggage you bring in, the resurrection story is for you. We can come today, no matter what the experience is, and be unified together in the resurrection life of Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're a sincere seeker after God, don't miss this chance. I invite you, just right where you are, to connect with the Lord. You can do that this morning. You can pray to him. He'll listen. He's not a distant God. You can say in heartfelt prayer silently along with me now. In fact, I'll lead you. Let's just bow together if you'll pray with me in your own way, in your own words. You don't have to look around. You don't have to impress him. Just tell the Lord, God, thank you for inviting me into the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, you are so good. Jesus, I believe what you did on the cross paid my penalty, and I accept it. And Lord, I confess, just like everyone here, that I have sinned, and I need your forgiveness. So Lord, right now in the quiet of this moment, I turn from my sin. I walk 180 degrees away from it in full repentance. I agree with you on the hideousness of my sin and what it did to you on the cross. Thank you for taking my payment. Thank you for righting the wrongs in my life. In this moment, Lord, I turn over control to you. Holy Spirit, enter my life. Seal me for the day of redemption. Make me a child of the King and take charge from now on. I can pray this because of what Jesus did, so it's in his powerful name that we pray. Amen.